My name is Alexis Boylan. I am the Director of Academic Affairs um, at the University of Connecticut's Humanities Institute. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Manuel Lima. Um, in this moment, when many of us are working in different places and meeting remotely, we acknowledge the traditional stewards of the land on which we are gathered and of the lands where remote participants, which would be all of us, are currently working. And we recognize their continuous connection to the land, water, and cultures. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We are super excited today. Um, uh, I um, count myself amongst uh, Professor Lima's super fans um, uh, to hear his lecture today, design and author Manuel Lima, who will be um, speaking on the tree diagram, mapping branches of knowledge. This event is co-sponsored with the umbraic story of the tree project and the exhibition Seeing Truth. Seeing Truth is in its last weeks here at the Benton, so please check that out if the, you are at the University of Connecticut. I also just want to thank um, Professor Catherine Moore um, for helping to coordinate this event, and also Global Affairs, who have helped sponsor um, the Umbraic uh, Story of the Tree Project, and so many um, really productive dialogues that go on on our campus. Now, um, uh, uh, for um, uh, our introduction um, of our speaker today, Professor Lima is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts named, quote, one of the 50 most creative and influential minds by Creativity Magazine. He is the founder of visualcomplexity.com, author of three best-selling books, and the head of design at intros.ai. He is also a respected design leader and startup mentor and a regular lecturer at conferences around the world. Professor Lima has 15 years of experience designing digital experiences and leading product teams at, com at companies like Google, Microsoft, Nokia, and R slash GA. He loves big ideas and ambitious projects and believes in the explosive mix of grit, talent, and optimism. He grows smart and talented teams through empowerment and autonomy, mentoring and inspiration, and let's not forget fun and passion. Um, and particular to this audience, um, Professor Lima is the author of three books Books that have been translated into numerous languages and his latest um uh and um I wouldn't say it's my favorite I as I said I'm a super fan I I, I um uh, love all of his books um uh, but his latest book is the book of circles visualizing spheres of knowledge from 2017 and it covers a thousand years of humanity's long-lasting obsession with all things circular and with that um it is my great pleasure to welcome Manuel Lima Thank you so much, Alexis. Thank you so for the for the very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. Well, so today, as Alexis was mentioning, I was I'm really going to focus on the long story of the tree diagram, right? And in order to do that, I really want to go back to the book that I published back in 2014, the Book of Trees: Visualizing Branches of Knowledge which really captures this passion and this long interest that I've had for, for the tree diagram. And this is, by the way, a book about the tree diagram, not about real trees. <laughs> I love this one star <laughs> rating that I got on Amazon saying, this book sucks, has nothing to do with my gardening interests <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, it offered nothing for me to use and I gave it away. So yes, it is a book about not real trees, but metaphorical trees, the tree diagram. And the book really uh, goes into detail about not just the long story of the tree diagram, but also how it has evolved over time into all these different sort of uh, visual metaphors and models, many of them are commonly used today in many computer systems we have around the globe, right? So it, it is uh, a diagram that is far from vanishing and it will likely continue for many, many centuries to come. But why make a book of, on trees, you may ask, right? And that's a very valid question. <laughs> I think, you know, when back in, back in the day when I was thinking about doing a book on trees, I think two things came to mind. One is, really telling an untold story, which we're gonna to get to in a, in a second. And the second reason was really, really oppose our present bias, you know, our presentism, this obsession with the present as the pinnacle of, of civilization, which we're gonna go into uh, 
very soon as well. So telling an untold story, right? So this story really started with my first book, my very first book back in 2011 called Visual Complexity, Mapping Patterns of Information. And in this book, I also tried to provide a taxonomy, but in this case was actually a taxonomy of different network visualization models, all the different ways that humans were using to visualize uh, networks, right? And what I love about this is this almost this almost feels like an emergent visual alphabet that as designers and scientists are creating a lot of these visual metaphors and models and, and charts and diagrams, they are maybe unconsciously creating a whole different set of tools like an alphabet that others will be able to use in the future. But I'm obsessed about the origin of things. And in my very first book on networks, I wanted to get to the origin. Who were the first people to actually think about the network diagram? What were the first network diagrams? And that, of course, took me to the work of Jacob Moreno. Uh, he was really the first person back in 1934 to create what we today know as a social network. But the New York Times, uh, the first time they saw a social network, like the ones you see on the left side, they call this model a psychological geography model because that was not even the, the concept of a social network. It was so novel, right? This is, again, uh, almost 90 years ago. But I wanted to go further back, right? And this journey also took me to the work of the famous mathematician, Leonard Euler, right? Who, who is credited with really the birth of network science, as we know, and this like abstraction of a diagram. It's kind of like a famous math mathematical sort of um, quandary and uh, but then I was I wanted to go even further back right so, you know the 18th century was not enough I wanted to go even further back and this is when I discovered trees the tree diagram right as really the predecessor the the, the most important predecessor of today's network diagrams and the more ancient tree illustrations I discovered the more obsessed I became. Uh, and chapter one of my very first book, Visual Complexity, was actually titled The Tree of Life, because he wanted to give this sort of the origin where it all started. It started off with, this, with these beautiful tree diagrams. But I knew, right, that this long evolution of, of the tree metaphor was too much to, for a single chapter, right? It, it needed its own volume, it needed its own book. And that's when the book of trees started sort of coming together in my in my head. So that was one reason, right? Um, Pal is really this untold story uh, that is so remarkable in, in so many different ways. And the second reason is really for us to oppose our present bias, really. this bias for the present as this uh, most important moment in, in our history. And of course, you know, in a world of Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok, we have really become obsessed by the latest, the, the freshest, right? News article, tweet, post, et cetera. But even this mindset, right, is also unfortunately how sometimes we look at history, right? So most books on information visualization or data visualization, uh, this is how they normally portray the emergence of the, the field of information design, right? There's this burst of interest today for this discipline, uh, information visualization. And then for context, most books on this topic go as far back as maybe the 19th century, 1918th century, right? As if there's nothing else before that. And this is actually what I, I wrote in the book. Given the recent surge of interest for the field, it's tempting to contemplate information visualization as an entirely new discipline rising to meet the demands of the 21st century, right? We have all these masses of data, and here we are creating a very new discipline, again, to, to, to meet the demand of that we have in terms of data abundance. But this couldn't be further from the truth, right? We need to ask ourselves, what happened before the 19th and 18th century? Was it really a blank slate? Absolutely not, absolutely not. 
And Michael Friendly wrote the following, there certainly have been many new things in the world of visualization, but unless you know its history, everything might seem novel. This is a really great testament on the importance of looking backwards and not be so focused on the present. And a great way for us to do that is to have this broad look at history to truly understand impact, right? I love this diagram by the, the Long Enough Foundation. Maybe some of you uh, know what that is, but it's really elongating this idea of the present, of the now. It now might be, you know, three days, one week. Nowadays, 30 years. The long now is really the last 20,000 years. For the most part, everything we call the, the historical evolution of humankind, right? The documented history and evolution of humankind. So by elongating that, we actually give enough presence and enough importance to things that predate us by many centuries and millennia. And this is really, really critical for us to do as a, as a species, right? But even then, you know, if you look at most books on history, as I'm sure many of you do, most books on history focus on either a specific topic or, visualiza or civilization, such as you know, Babylon or ancient Greece, perhaps the Maya civilization, perhaps the Inca empire, or they focus on a very specific period of time, right? That's 12th century, the 15th century, the age of enlightenment and the digital age, right? It's very focused either horizontally or vertically. But I'm very, I'm actually not that interested in those kind of stories. I think they can be very narrow. I'm really much more interested in larger stories that traverse time and space. What French philosopher uh, Lotard calls the meta narrative, right? A narrative of narratives. And the beautiful thing for me about the tree is that it is one, one matter, meta narrative. It is a narrative of narratives, right? that has been with us for many, many centuries, if not millennia. This is actually a, 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 set, a statement from Wired Magazine that said about the Book of Trees, it's a visual metaphor that's found across cultures throughout history, a data visualization tool that has outlived empires and endured huge upheavals in the arts, arts and sciences. It has lasted for so long and we will likely continue to do so for many more centuries to come. So that's really, you know, kind of the rationale or, or at least the reason why I decided to do the book in, in the first place, right? To tell this untold story and a beautiful sort of narrative of narrative story of the tree diagram. So what is this story, right? You might ask yourselves, let's go into the details. Well, for me, the story really, be, you know, really begins, it probably starts be before that, but it really begins around 800 years ago. And, this was a really interesting period back in medieval Europe where there was a lot of new knowledge coming from the ancient world, from ancient Rome and ancient Greece, uh, you know, propagated throughout Europe by Muslim scholars. This was also the time where the, the, the rise, we, we, we witnessed the rise of university libraries completely detached from in religion, right? These were new centers of scholarly teaching and research. We also saw the introduction of Arabic numerals, uh, which also facilitated organization and reference of new material, which was fairly important back then. And this in turn caused you know, different things. One of, one of them being, of course, the, uh, the increase in book production, also, of course, propelled by the invention of printing and cheaper paper. So all of a sudden, you didn't have just you know, a few dozen books, but you had hundreds and hundreds of books. So how to classify those volumes of information, how to make sense of them, how to structure them became a huge concern, right? So classification and organization together with Arabic numerals was you know, a huge emphasis back then. But for me, again, of course, because I'm, I'm a designer and I love uh, studying visual culture, right? In historical visual culture, this is when we also see a huge emphasis in visual communication, right? The diagrammatic presentation of the material, sometimes replacing text altogether, right? There was a lot of emphasis on, on images, on the power of images, possibly replacing, in many instances, text uh, altogether. 
this is when we see the, the emergence of the, this is really the age of the first large universal encyclopedias, right? Trying to encapsulate the whole of human knowledge. There are so many of them and many of them beautifully illustrated with diagrams like this one. Uh, here is, of course, one of the most famous ones, Etymologies by Isidore of Seville, right? The first one uh, written in 60, uh, 630, a pretty, pretty old, right, material. And you see some of the beautiful diagrams that populate this, this encyclopedia. At the very core, you have, we have, of course, the famous uh, TO map. This is you know, an illustration that really became super popular in, in medieval Europe throughout many manuscripts. It's a depiction of the globe, right? With Asia at the top, Europe at the bottom left, and Africa at the bottom right. And this sort of abstract, simplified version of the globe became, again, a huge popular visual metaphor throughout, uh, throughout medieval Europe. We also uh, see other cases. This one, of course, the Nuremberg Chronicle. Many of you might know this incredible book. This is this is actually a, an early incunabulum. Uh, this is a, really a story of the history of the world portrayed by a, an array of beautiful depictions like the ones you see here. This was actually the first book to portray, to graphically portray many European cities, right? This is again, 1493, you know, centuries before photography was even a thing. So for you can imagine the significance for many of the citizens of these uh, villages and cities to see them visualized, represented graphically for the very first time in their lives, right? This must have been quite uh, uh, an event on its own. And then, of course, even the work of Athanasius Kircher. I love Kircher because he was absolutely obsessed with uh, representing, graphically representing complex information, right? And here you have people thinking that, you know, what, why do we need even text? You know, images could become this very, this brand new language that could be a universal language in, in many ways. And again, some of the diagrams that Kircher uh, created. But all of, all of these visual metaphors that we just saw, and there were many, right, we, we just saw, um, and it, it was a very sort of experimental period where people were trying different metaphors, different models to see what, what's, what stuck with, with the audiences. Out of all these uh, visual metaphors and archetypes, the most popular of them was the tree, the tree diagram. And of course, many of you might ask, why trees, right? Of all things, why was tree such, became such a popular uh, metaphor? Well, you know, in many ways today, I think it's hard for us to imagine this, given that we look around us and we only see, you know, buildings and concrete and glass and iron. But, you know, for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, we as a species, we relied on trees for almost everything, right? For survival. We relied on them for shelter, for food, for resources, for weaponry, for tools, you name it, right? They give us everything. And of course, it's no matter, it's not surprising that even today, many of us look at a beautiful tree and there's something really in immensely powerful about that, that creature. So it's probably by no accident that uh, trees became over time important religious symbols across the world, right? Across space and time. We can see trees being, uh, again, religious, important religious symbols, right? We can see sacred trees dating back to ancient summer and, and Babylon and Assyria. We can see uh, the sacred trees or trees of life in ancient Egypt, we can see them in Judaism. This is, of course, the famous Kabbalah tree, the tree of life. Uh, of course, in Christianity, Christianity actually has you know, two separate trees, the tree of life and the tree of good and evil, portrayed in the Bible. We, of course, see it in Buddhism, right? Uh, this is the famous Bodhi tree in the middle. Where under which uh, Gautama attained enlightenment. And even today, if you travel in, in many countries in, in Eastern Asia, you see these beautiful, immensely large fig trees decorated with, you know, filled with colors and bands, because they still today have, you know, uh, an immense reverence for the people that inhabited those places. 
Of course, the Mayans also had their own version of a sacred tree, right? It was called the Yeshte tree of life that unified the celestial, the terrestrial, and the underworld. And so here we can see how, again, trees were really a, a, an omnipresent sort of uh, symbol for civilizations across space and time. But at some point, trees also became important knowledge classification systems. And this is where I think, for me, things started to become really interesting because they became important communication tools to illustrate various systems of knowledge. Systems of knowledge normally tied with ideas of order, of hierarchy, of, of unity and symmetry. We can see how trees have been used to map things like morality, right? Here we can see the tree of virtues and the tree of vices. It's really funny if you look at medieval manuscripts, uh, the tree of virtues is normally very exuberant and green and filled with fruits. And the tree of vices is very de in decaying, right? It's in decay, it's dying. The, the one on the, the right side, for example, is a tree of vices, right? You can feel like the branches are turning downwards, right? As if it's, you know, somehow dying. So they played with all of these sort of visual affordances, colors and, and, and metaphors as well. Uh, we, of course, see trees for, for mapping consanguinity, right? To map the blood ties between people. Uh, this was actually a really important uh, purpose at the time where the church imposed limitations on marrying close relatives. So some of these diagrams were actually kind of tools that people use on a regular basis to understand what was going on. And then we also see, one second. We also see trees, of course, uh, being used to map genealogy, right? This is likely the most obvious of all family trees. Many of you probably have seen family trees, either your own or someone else's, right? We have all associ always associated trees with, with family and genealogy. But even the most interesting thing that I discovered during my research was how trees have also been used to map systems of law. And this is perhaps even the, whole, the oldest version. There are instances, even though I couldn't find any illustration, but there are instances that mention the word, the, the use of tree diagrams by, uh, by lawyers in ancient Rome. So it could possibly have been actually one of the first uses of the tree diagram as a, as a tool for communication. And I love this particular illustration because at the very top of the one that you see on the right side, at the very top, you have written in Latin, since the matter of this title is too intricate, difficult, and hard to explain, it might be easier to comprehend using the figurative art of a trunk. So here we have a very intentional use of the tree diagram as a means to simplify the diversity, right? And explain a fairly complex and intricate topic. We of course see trees being used as to map all of human knowledge by this beautiful trees of knowledge by Ramon Bull, right? These, these are actually, every time you mention the word, when you say, so for example, genetics is a branch of science or biology is a branch of science, we owe this linguistic metaphor to Ramon Lul because Ramon Lul was actually the first one to conceive all of human knowledge, right? That's all the science is known to man as a tree organism, which is a fascinating thing. And he did so in with these beautiful illustrations that you see here. Uh, there's, of course, the, the famous uh, 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 tree mapping knowledge, right, from the French Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia. Uh, the, this is really the bastion of the French Enlightenment, right? In 1780, it's one of the largest encyclopedias produced until then, accounting for 20 million words in 70,000 articles and 3,000 illustrations. And here you have this beautiful fold out that is meant to represent all of human knowledge and direct the users into the different sections of the encyclopedia. And of course, you know, we see this also applied to other areas of knowledge, including biology, genetics, and of course, the work of Charles Darwin. The illustration that you actually see on the very side, uh, on the right side, it was the single, there was only one single illustration in all of the book, 
in the entire book on the origin of species by Darwin. And this was it. And there's actually a letter from Darwin to the publisher saying, this is absolutely paramount that is shown, is published in the book with the manuscript. Darwin understood the relevance and the power of an image like this one to explain a fairly complex idea. And this is, of course, what Darwin called the tree of life, right? This specific illustration. And then, of course, another uh, huge follower and advocate of Darwin was Ernst Ankel. And Ankel really expanded a lot of the ideas around applying uh, trees to mapping species and, and, and biology by creating a variety of different trees of, you know, tying together all species known to man. And these are just a sample of the many, many beautiful diagrams that he has created. We also see, you know, a bit more recently, uh, we can also be creative in uh, some of the uses of the tree diagram. This one is actually mapping, it's called the petroleum tree, and it's showing all the different ramifications uh, of different things we are able to create from crude oil alone. Or even this one, even more recent, from 1961. It's one of the earliest, if not the first computer tree that's mapping the evolution of different programming languages from you know, starting with ENIAC in 1945, and then sort of spreading out in a variety of different ways. Or even this one that maps a tree of different connections between a series of popular blogs, right? Which is really, really uh, interesting as well. And, and blogs are represented as leaves and the color indicates a specific blog level score determined by traffic to the website. They're also grouped in different branches, indicating different categories like a startup, design, or data, right? So there's a lot of reasoning and rationale behind some of these illustrations, right? We just have to sort of understand what they actually are representing. What I love about this specific illustration is that it's the last illustration of chapter one of the Book of Trees. And the very first one, and the last are separated by roughly 800 years, right? So it's something really powerful to see how this incredible diagram is far from dying out, right? It has, if, if anything, has been, again, gaining more and more popularity in, in its different ramifications, which we're going to look at. But it's really powerful to see, again, how this uh, tree diagram continues for so long. And so the book then tells the story a little bit about uh, a transition, right? It introduces a lot of these figurative trees, like I just, you know, shown to all of you. That's chapter one. But then the remaining chapters, we talk about two revolutions that happen. The first revolution happens in what we call today node link diagrams. At some point, we don't know exactly when or exactly who was responsible for this. But someone must have realized that the hierarchical logic of the tree could be conveyed without many of its natural embellishments, right? Without all of the leaves, the branches, and shrubbery. And this opened the door to a whole new set of models, right? And this revolution, this is really much almost like what, you know, in biology, you would call like the Cambrian explosion, right? It led to so many different explorations. This was a much more stylized and abstract con construct, right? What we, again, we called noting diagrams. And in the book, I talk about all of these different types from vertical trees to multi-directional trees, and even things like hyperbolic trees, which is some of the most uh, fancier wow. examples. The first one, of course, is the vertical tree. Vertical trees, you can see them, you know, pretty far, right, I, back in time. You know, the, the, the example on the middle is actually from 1205, so pretty old example. And what's interesting about uh, vertical trees is that they are normally inverted trees, which means that the root is actually at the top. Now, it is at the top, and then, of course, the, the different uh, branches are falling downwards. It is done so because back in the day, these were long... Uh, parchment scrolls, right? And the root had to be at the very top. So as you unroll, right? As you unroll the parchment in the scroll, right? You would actually see the root first and you'd see the various uh, descendants, if this was a family tree, the various uh, 
um, subdivisions and branches of this particular tree. That's why inverted tree has become, you know, even today, really the norm for a lot of these more modern node link diagrams. Now, I love to show this example because, you know, if, if we were in archaeology, this is what they would call a transitional fossil, right? <laughs> it, it's almost one of those situations where uh, it's, it's a vertical tree, first of all, depicting, uh, depicting the genealogy of the Duke of, of Burgundy, Charles the Bold. But what I love about this is that it's, it seems like the designer in this case is almost undecided on which sort of um, approach they should take, right? Are they keeping with, the, again, the natural embellishments, you know, the shrubberies and fruits, or going in this more sort of like circular and geometric type of approach of typical of a node link diagram, right? It's almost, again, this transitional fossil between species, right, as, as things are moving and evolving. And I also, of course, I cannot avoid showing this comparison, uh, which really says a lot about how our interests have changed over time. <laughs> In you know, this example on the left is depicting a genealogy of Christ, and the example on the right, you know, uh, from 2011, is depicting a genealogy of of X Men, <laughs> the X Men family tree. So it's just funny to see how things. And they are and incredibly, they still look very much alike, right? And again, again, they are separated by roughly 800 years and in, in a very different topic altogether. These are, you know, uh, uh, horizontal trees. Uh, I wanted to show some of, the, of you this, uh, some of these examples. Here we can see uh, arguably what I think it's one of the most beautiful examples on the book. The book actually takes a full spread to show this, this image. This is again a tree uh, of the morality, a tree of morality, as we saw before. And notice here again how uh, the tree of virtue on the left side is bright, exuberant, filled with red flowers, right? And the tree of vices on the right side is, you know, doesn't have as much color. There's no fruits. There are no, you know, red flowers. It's it's kind of in decay or or dying, if anything, right? The the good tree and the bad tree. And, you know, but sometimes our interests haven't changed that much. <laughs> this is actually an example of an horizontal tree from 2008 uh, that actually said, that actually maps all sentences from the Bible that starts, and God something, right? And God said, and God saw, and God made, and God uh, blessed, and then keeps on going just all the different sort of sentences that came out of that. This is an example of a multi-directional tree, uh, again, showing this uh, very loose and free-form layout. It was not really vertical or horizontal. Sometimes a lot of the trees that we saw, in, that I witnessed in my research is, is kind of free-form, like the ones that you see here. And this is a beautiful example from uh, modern days. But then, of course, you know, we see a lot of, a lot of, uh, models adapting the circle, right? And of course, circles carry a huge significance, right? Uh, also to cultures around the world. I should know because as Alexis mentioned in the beginning, I did write a book on circles. Uh, and I think it was probably not on my mind when I put together the Book of Trees, but nonetheless, it was, it's a really powerful uh, symbol, right? For many cultures across space and time. So it's no wonder why at some point someone uh, thought about uh, using the circle as as an anchor for representing trees as well. And radial trees normally work, they normally have the roots at the very center. Here you can see how the president is at the very core of the circle. And then the various divisions and subdivisions spread out towards the periphery of the circle. And the next one was really hyperbolic trees, right? So uh, hyperbolic trees are a type of radial tree, but it's showing this really dynamic way of interacting with a lot of the nodes so that as you zoom in to a specific area of this radial tree, uh, the remaining uh, nodes become smaller and, moves to, and move towards the periphery, which is kind of hard to do it in a, in a physical context. And so this was really the 
the, one of the, the two big revolutions that I mentioned in the book, right? So one is this transition from a figurative tree to a series of node link diagrams. Now, the second big transition happened much sooner, right? Pretty fairly recent, you know, in the last few decades. And it's also opened the door to a whole new set of, of models and experiments. And the logic here is instead of having uh, a node, right? And then the sub nodes connected with lines, you start the node with having a single geometric shape. And then you keep subdividing that shape to indicate hierarchy. And this is what is called a tree map, right? Which is still, again, a tree, it's still mapping a hierarchy. And it's actually sometimes more powerful because you can have more variables added to the dimensions of the, of the geometric shapes and colors and so on. And this was actually the very first modern uh, rectangular tree map created by Ben Schneiderman back in 1991. And this is when he was trying to solve the, the common problem of a filled hard drive, right? His hard drive was filled, and Steinmeier became obsessed with the idea of creating a really compact visualization to see, you know, what was happening, where was most of the data located at, what was needed some attention when it, when it comes to data storage, right? So this was really a representation of a disk hard drive back in 1991. And again, this opened the door <laughs> to a whole different set of, of models and diagrams uh, like, you know, Voronoi tree maps and circular tree maps. And sometimes we see sunbursts as well. These, many of these have, have been created fairly recent and I'm sure they will, you know, many more will be created you know, in the next few decades. So this is an example, let's say, of a, of a rectangular tree map. This is actually a, one of my favorite projects. This was called the News Map back in 2004. It was mapping Google News through this visualization method, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, rectangular tree map. And, um, and let me just move the light here. And, uh, you know, different colors are representing different categories of articles and size is actually indicated in indication of popularity. So there's just, again, a lot of variables at play here in this particular visualization. Then you go into like Voronoi tree maps, which shake a much more organic shape. The shapes are not as clearly defined as squares, like the, the examples we saw before, but they take these very organic shapes. Um, and sometimes they, they are also immensely aesthetic to look at because it kind of looked like, uh, you know, stained glass at times. And they are really gorgeous uh, to look at. Um, this is an example of a circular tree map. It's basically circles within circles. So the main circle is the root. And then you keep on having circles and circles inside circles to indicate, again, the notion of hierarchy or nesting, right, as they normally use in this context. This is an example of a circular tree map, which is, again, very similar to a circular uh, uh, tree diagram, node link diagram, in the sense that the core is the root, right? And it keeps on subdividing towards the periphery. Uh, in the different sort of branches and sub branches. And again, the beautiful thing about some of the tree maps is that the, the, the area itself can be used to signify something, right? A, a specific quantity that you might have. In this case, it's actually mapping photography. It's the number of photographs of it on, on a given theme and sub theme. Uh, or even this example, it's the final one that I have on the book. Uh, this is an example of a, an icicle tree. Icicle trees are a really uh, cool method as well. It's very compact. I'm actually surprised it hasn't been used more often. It can be, again, vertical or horizontal. It's basically you have music, let's say, very on the left side, and then you just keep on subdividing by artists, you know, albums, songs, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, it's, again, a, a different way of looking at, at the hierarchy in, in this particular way. And so these are many of the hundreds of images that I have exposed in, uh, in the book, right, in the Book of Trees. And so, you know, sometimes people ask me, and I think I might have just a little bit of time to, to take you a, a little bit of just a, a few more slides on the behind the scenes. I think a lot of people normally ask me, uh, 
um, well, what's at stake? Like how much how much work is involved in putting a book like this together? So for the next, you know, maybe three minutes or so, let me walk you through what is somehow implied in this type of work, right? The behind the scenes. So doing research on old material is never easy at all. It really isn't. But fortunately today, many museums, libraries, and institutions like the ones you see here are ma making their vast body of work available online. And that has made a huge difference for people like myself, right? A curious sort of uh, author to be able to like, you know, sitting in a cafe in Brooklyn, go into the archives of, you know, the University of Chicago or the Library of Congress or, you know, the, the, the British Museum, uh, you know, some library in Germany. It's incredible to have that opportunity for the first time. And it, that has made a huge change. To be honest, like sometimes I do say that to people that many of my books, both the Book of Trees and certainly the Book of Circles, I don't think I would have been able to do, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Or I would, but it would have taken much longer and much more expensive trips to actually uh, being able to pull that together. Uh, well, doing a book on trees, <laughs> part of, you know, part of doing this uh, means that you have to know how to type tree in every conceivable human language. <laughs> but perhaps most importantly, you have to learn how to, how to say tree in languages like Latin, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, German, because a lot of these uh, libraries uh, are you know national libraries so some sometimes you don't even have you know information in English right so knowing that up front helps a lot sometimes you know we don't find a lot of information on an image which is really really disappointing sometimes you find uh, incredible manuscripts with a lot of dead ends with no images whatsoever um, sometimes when you do finally find some like a really compelling illustration right there's there's not a lot of information about it it's it's really sparse but sometimes you only have a year that the image was produced and if you're really really lucky really lucky you get the author's name and that's when the real fun begins right if you have the author's name then you are trying to find as much information as possible about the author right uh, about their life you know the work or you go to wikipedia to google books internet archive museums gallery i mean every kind of source that can give you more insight about the author's life and and that possibly could connect to that specific illustration that's really where the, the hardcore research <laughs> comes in but you know sometimes you might also be invited for a birthday party at the Rubin Museum of of art in New York as I was only to find out that you know Tibetan Buddhism uses hundreds of tree diagrams these are called refuge trees showing various gurus and lamas in the tree, which are beautiful. There are so many in it. So many are beautiful, absolutely. And of course, you always want to just include, hey, let me include 20 or 40 in the book, <laughs> only to find out that they are super expensive. <laughs> you have to pay a lot of image rights to do that, even for a single image. And you can only include two in the book, which I did, right? There's two or two of them in the book, but not you know the 20 that maybe I wanted in the first place. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of the book is 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 not as fancy or, or exciting as you might think. A lot of it is very sort of uh, admin, doing a lot of admin work, uh, mostly on emails, hundreds and hundreds of emails, getting approval, getting the assets, you know. I did some sort of color coding back in the day to understand, you know, if I had finally got the email the approval to use to use it, you know, you have to go off to people. It's just really painful. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And of course, organizing and categorizing all the images, you know, by sizes, uh, also using some sort of color coordination here. I use Adobe Bridge for, I think, all my books up to today, which is a fascinating tool because you can just organize them and you can add metadata to the images. It's it's a really, really great tool for doing, doing books like, like these ones. And then, of course, there's, you know, tax, you know, it's not just finishing the, the tax and sending it to the publisher. Uh, it takes many revisions. I still remember, I still recall 
the very first revision I got, everything was red, filled with notes. I was almost crying. Uh, and it's really rough, right? There's several revisions, yeah, but, it, but it really helps, you know, getting it to a, you know, to, to a close to perfection, as, as close as you can get. Uh, you know, things like grammar, sourcing, right, annotations. It really matters a lot getting it really, really uh, to the nitty gritty uh, of the text. Uh, and then finally, the, the fun part, at least for me as a designer, even though I don't have a lot of freedom there, they don't let authors, at least with a, my previous publisher, authors interact too close with the designer. Otherwise, things can go wrong. But, you know, it's really the, the fun part of doing, you know, several design revisions on the cover, right? Trying to get to what is the right cover for, for a book like this that really conveys, you know, the, what is, you know, what's, what's inside, right? The, the kind of message and, and content that, that we worked so hard uh, to put together. And this is it. Finally, you got, you know, the final, the very final book. And it's a fun moment to get it and then unwrap the first box of books, physical books like these ones. And, and you're, if you're lucky, you also got, uh, you know, to be picked up by different media types like Wired and New Scientist and Fast Company and, and so on. Um, and, you know, immediately the book got great reviews, which is really, really fun. And I love about that aspect about many of my past books in the sense that they touch a great gamut of of audiences you know from wired to new scientists to you know the boston globe or gizmodo so design you know science art technology uh, and that's really fun for me you know i think it, it really conveys this idea of of a merit narrative right and this narrative of narratives that touches so many different fields of knowledge and I think that's uh, a good point, right? I think that's that really makes me happy as well. That it, it it reaches so many different people from so many different backgrounds and disciplines. And that's it. And hopefully there's enough time for questions. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'm going to abuse my position as the like moderator of this and actually ask the first question. Of course. I, um, First of all, as a visual culture specialist, I very much appreciate you communicating how um, a giant pain in the ass part of putting out a book like this is the <laughs> aspect of like uh, images. And I, um, your Excel file uh, made me, it was triggering. Um, I had a lot of feelings about it, but I appreciate that that's a huge part of this. My question is a more scholarly one. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the limits or the the ways in which trees actually fail us as mm. sort of models of knowledge communication. Um, I think your talk rightfully and interestingly in your book sort of highlights how these are such important communicative skills, but I'm actually interested in hearing about how you have come to sort of perhaps see them as also limited or uh, what sort of problems in terms of communicating knowledge come about when we um, when we have to contain it or quarantine it within this sort of tree model. That's a, such a great question, Alex. And to be honest, like sometimes I do say that, that if you are new to my work, you should really read my books in reverse order because in many ways, I started writing about networks, right? And then I navigated backwards in time. I went to trees, and then I wanted to go even further back to the very, very first diagrams, and that took me to the circles. But if you read them in reverse order, right, you get the, 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 the history of, you know, visual metaphors and, and, and uh, vis visualization, and you start with the circles, you then go to, to the trees. And then the, the next of the trees is, of course, the network. And the book, when I, chapter one of, of my book on tree on networks, my very first one is, of course, the tree of life. And uh, the, the second chapter of that book, following the tree of life, is called From Trees to Networks. Because I do feel like there's a, a really important transition, uh, and it's something that I've, I've spoken uh, you know, in different lectures about. There's a, a really important transition from trees to networks. Not saying that networks have to replace all types of trees. I think trees, as a metaphor, as a diagram, will continue for many centuries. However, the limitations of the tree diagram is, is the following. It represents a hierarchy, right? That's for and most what it's really meant for. And sometimes not 
many of the systems that surround us, both natural and artificial, are actually hierarchical. A lot of systems in nature are actually non-hierarchical, are really what we call complex systems, right? They are they have a dense network of interdependencies. Take ecosystems, for example, right? You can never depict an ecosystem by means of a, of a tree. It's absolutely the, the wrong model to do so, right? A network is a much better one. Still a very complex network. That's, you know, space for another discussion. But I think the limitations of the tree really came across in, I would say, about a century ago when we, we discovered things like, you know, chaos theory and complex complexity science, when we start to really understand the complexity that really abounds us. And, and this is where, of course, the network metaphor, in many cases, replaced trees altogether. Now, having said that, there's also the possibility of hybrids. And, and one case, for example, is, is the way we map human knowledge, right? So everyone knows the, the Dewey Decimal System, right? Which is a very highly hierarchical system to map, you know, all the books and the themes, right? So that's fine, but that's also not the way that our brains operate. Our brains are much more idiosyncratic, right? And much more like a network. But if you have some structure, right? Because trees are great for providing structure and stability with aspects of a, of a network that allow you to traverse between the branches, to connect between branches, could actually be a really interesting model. And in some cases could actually work. But again, I think the way we understand things like cities, the way we understand the human brain, the way we understand ecosystems, these are just a few cases where trees have a lot of limitations and are probably not the right ma method to visualize and networks are much, much uh, more suited for something like this. Thanks, that's really helpful. We're gonna to turn to the Q&A and if anybody in the audience has questions that they would like to ask um, uh, Manuel Lima, please put them in the Q&A. Um, the first one is from an anonymous attendee. Were you seeing earlier evidence of data um, visualization in Chinese and Egyptian or Indian cultures prior to 800 years ago? Um, right, yes, uh, not, I didn't discover that many. Uh, there is, representations in in Egypt as far as I know of trees but but not as communication as tools for communication right uh, when it comes to circles circles I think I was able to expand my my breath a little bit more from a just from a cultural standpoint because you find a lot more examples you know I, I remember many of the examples that I have both from China and Korea uh, of ancient ancient visualizations depicted we using the circle metaphor. But trees, I couldn't find that many, right? Uh, you know, I was even talking to my to the Japanese translator of my book, the book of trees, who has also done a, a, an immense body of research on on Japanese culture and, and how far back uh, the tree goes. And it seems there's something really gravitating towards medieval Europe. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure why. I think a lot of that is tied with the art of memory. This is something that is, I think, for me, the genesis of information design as we know it. It's a notion of building this mnemonic tools for, for representing knowledge, right? And at the same time, they were, again, experimenting with all these different visual metaphors. And, and that's when, uh, you know, things like the tree diagram uh, emerged. This is, we're talking about, you know, 12th century, sometimes even as far back as the 11th century. Um, but other countries might have, but sometimes it's just so hard because it's, a lot of this information is still, um, you know, uh, not very uh, open uh, to researchers like myself. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, well, I don't see any more questions coming in. I did actually want to, while we have you, ask you what your next project is, um, uh, where you'll be <laughs> taking us next in terms of <laughs> knowledge and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, so my bio says that my latest book was actually the Book of Circle, which is true from, you know, it's still the, the very latest published book. But my next one to be published in May this year is actually going to be different. It's called The New Designer, uh, Rejecting Myths and Embracing Change. And I actually, it's something that I, I decided to challenge myself. I think it's, it's not going to be as visual. To be honest, I really wanted to challenge myself to a point where there's not one single image in that book. And it's, it's a book much more about the ethics of design in the contemporary society, right? Our responsibility towards the environment and society in general. 
And I think that's going to be the focus of my next work. I think I might go back to visual culture. I think I have a lot of ideas on, 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 on topics and things that I want to write about in the future. But who knows? Who knows? But it's not going to be a book about triangles. I, I get that question quite often. <laughs> what comes, you know, book of trees, book of circles. Triangles so it's coming, out, it's, it's coming out in May, though? It's coming out in May. Yeah, the, it's called the, the New Designer. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Something for all of us to look forward to. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. This has of been course. an amazing talk and a great sort of kickoff event for the um, uh, the Tree of Life project that we're working on here at UConn. Thank you so much Perfect. for your time. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. You.